case, the judges that just spoke uh, started to hone in on exactly what we're going for, which is the disingenuousness of the DOJ in this case. We really want to expose that fact. But first of all, I want to, I'll speak in just a moment, but I'd like to open this up with our two lawyers, Ruth Alperin and Carl Mayer, and then we've got a lineup for you of the plaintiffs and other people who have supported us from day one. So, starting out with Ruth Alperin. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you're free to ask any questions. Let me make a statement first. I suppose. Can you all hear me? Speak uh, louder! Shout! All right, I will speak. Give me a moment then. Where's your microphone? Yeah, I got it. Okay, that's the best way to get in the head. Okay. Um, I will speak as loud as I can. Uh, okay. If any of you are filming this and I sound like I'm screaming, use your data capacities to make me sound more normal. That's great. We argued today the case challenging the NDAA in the Court of Appeals. This is one of the elite courts in the United States, and the judges, I think, were really up to the court's reputation. They were very sharp in their questions on both sides. They really challenge the government to prove that this is, in fact, not a new law, but an old law that merely has been recodified. The government's position is that the NDAA is merely an old 10-year-old copy of the old AUMF, which is the authority Congress gave the government to go to war in Afghanistan. We've dissected this in our briefs, and Judge Forrest and the trial court clearly agreed that this law broadens any pre-existing power of the military to detain people in this country. In fact, since the 1860s, the Supreme Court has held that no American may be detained in the United States by the military. There is a constitutional barrier between the military and the civilian whether they are a citizen or not. The NDAA breaches that barrier. It allows for the first time by law the military to incarcerate citizens in this country. The government was challenged by the court to say that, to prove that this is an old law and is nothing new. The government could not do that. The AUMF plainly brought in any power of the government that previously existed. It is an attempt by the executive branch to take on vast detention authority, not akin to a democracy, but like most of the dictatorships we've had the misfortune to know over the last century. If this power is upheld and used, it means that Americans can be subject to military imprisonment if the government deems they go too far in supporting an unpopular cause tied to the Middle East or to terrorists. If someone raises money for Guantanamo inmates and sends that money to their lawyers to support their defenses, that could be substantial support of Al-Qaeda. If someone hosts a webcast and figures from terrorist groups or Al-Qaeda are invited, is that substantial support? This broad statute endangers basic speech. We've seen professors incarcerated in this country because of such actions. We've seen at least one journalist taken by the U.S. in Yemen. Mr. Al-Haj, who was later released after a long period of detention on this theory. Our client Chris Hedges was detained by the U.S. military long before this law was ever passed because he left the press pool. Surely, if this law now exists, such endangerment is going to be more common. The government says that independent journalism is not subject to this law. Well, we don't know what that means. It's not in the law, that exception. And administrations change their view. In fact, uh, Judge Kaplan bluntly said to the government, don't administrations frequently change their policies? In fact, you know, one notable example actually relates to medical marijuana, where the Obama administration early on said it would not prosecute such cases, but close to the election changed its policy and began prosecuting medical marijuana providers in California. Well, that's not an issue here. It demonstrates that a statement by the government today is not a guarantee of rights. Rights are guaranteed by the Constitution. 
rights are endangered when statutes usurp the Constitution. This case is about guaranteeing that we do not become a society dominated by the military. My colleague Paul Mayer will mention and discuss a letter from many generals addressing this statute. This case is about keeping that barrier absolutely clear between the military and the civilian jurisdiction. The framers of the Constitution were very clear to make certain of two things. One, that the military is always commanded by civilians. And two, that the military will never have authority over civilians. This law changes that long-standing rule. And it is a threat to the basic liberty of people in this country. <coughs> Do we think that concentration camps will arise from this? Of course not. But this is an erosion of basic principles of law. And it's our job as lawyers to stop that erosion before it grows further. There's an old saying, it fish rocks from the head down. When you threaten the Constitution in its basic goals of liberty, the rest of that body politic will begin to decay. Today we felt that the court was very thorough, was very active. They questioned us equally, which is their job. We don't know how they will rule. We think they should rule in our favor. We think the balance of the argument lies with us. But it is not our job to predict. It's our job to make our arguments. Uh, my colleagues will also say this. I want to thank the people who've been involved in this case. Bob Jaffe, who's worked with us. David Reeves has worked with us, both dedicated attorneys. Uh, Tangerine Bowl and Alexa O'Brien and many others. We have paralegals who've been actively involved. Uh, Dan Ellsberg and, and Noam Chomsky and Chris Hedges and Alexa O'Brien and Tangerine Boland and Brigitte Anstatir lent their names to this case. Okay, something many people would be afraid to do. I want to say one more thing. Carl Mayer and I launched the domestic surveillance class action six years ago. At that time, dozens of lawyers around the country joined with us. When we launched this case just a few months ago, throughout the great breadth of this land, only two other lawyers called us to join us. That was Bob Daff, Jaffe and David Reeves. That demonstrates the chilling effect that a statute like this has. Six years ago, before such a law, dozens of lawyers called and joined. Today, only two. That demonstrates the fear people begin to take on in a democracy. Thank you very much. I'll call and call well, if you have any, I'll let, let me have Paul speak, and then maybe you can throw questions to both of us. Then Chris Hedges will address you. What? Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Tangerine. By my count, today is day 4,163 of U.S. involvement in war, with no end in sight. This seems to be a perpetual war against an undefined enemy, terror. Even though this terror has existed for a long time, we have put all the military might of the country at the disposal of ongoing war. Today's challenge in court to the latest attempt to pass laws that would subject Americans to the detention of, of the military is just one of many statutes that both the Bush and the Obama administration have uh, passed and then worked to target domestic people within the United States of America. That includes citizens, residents, etc. You have in the United States now warrantless wiretapping. You have for the first time last year the FAA authorized 106 drones flying over our skies. And now this, this law seeks to make it lawful for the military to detain not just U.S. citizens but any civilians within our borders, which has been a, a principle, an article of faith in the United States law since at least ex parte Milligan, which is a, a, a Supreme Court case following the Civil War. So this is part of an effort to change the climate. We hope we will prevail in this litigation. The, the plaintiffs, uh, thankfully, I can't say how honored I am to represent uh, Daniel Ellsberg, Chris Hedges, Tangerine Bolin, Kai Wargala, yeah, Alexa O'Brien, uh, Alexa O'Brien, all of them together have worked to make this a very important, I think, challenge to the ever-encroaching national security state. And together, the plaintiffs and the lawyers have, challenged, have, have determined that whatever the outcome today in court, we will pursue this if we don't prevail. If we do prevail, we will continue to ask the Obama administration 
which said that they would veto this provision to honor that pledge and to make sure that forever there will not be detention by the military of American citizens. So, so that, is what, that is what we intend to do in the future. We, we can't read how the, the court will decide today, but we will pledge to, to, uh, to fight on into the future. I'd be happy to take questions. There are many, many people, I think, who uh, want to talk some of the plaintiffs. I'll let Tangerine orchestrate it, and I think we'll probably do a question there. Yeah. Well, we uh, let me just know, Paul corrected me. I omitted Kaiwagala when I noted on plaintiffs. She's a young German student, a master's degree student, who came in uh, to this country to testify specially despite the right. <laughs> Oh, and we, 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 I neglected, I neglected to, uh, I omitted, uh, Birgitta Janssen here. And Noam Chomsky. And Noam Chomsky. <laughs> I got it. I got it. You got it. All right, now we have everybody. We've covered everybody. We've covered the base. So, should we take questions? Yeah, let's take that again. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
at our instance to hear it on an expedited basis. Uh, typically these things take up uh, uh, months rather than weeks uh, unless the panel is, is, uh, it has some sort of foregone conclusion in mind. I, I will note the court suggested in the argument we might want to wait until the Supreme Court rules on the case called Clapper, also featuring our good friend Chris Hedges as a plaintiff, which involves a question of whether journalists have standing to challenge the FISA wiretap law. So the court might actually wait until the Supreme Court rules on that decision, and that might not come down until June. So we may have quite a bit of time to wait. Uh, behind you, there's a question. And we're gonna... uh, yes, you, you have mentioned that um, the jo free, uh, freelance journalists, they won't fit into, uh, they will fall into the law, into the NDAA. Uh, but my question is, and then somebody, one of you also mentioned that if you are uh, on the borders, they will be able to apply the law to you. So how about Julian Assange, who is right now in London? How about that law will apply to him if he is moving into the other country? The, the, the question was, uh, are independent journalists uh, in, uh, encompassed encapsulated or captured under the law, number one, and number two, how would uh, how would the law relate to Julian Assange? You know, the, the answer is Julian Assange is being investigated for a violation of the Espionage Act because he took documents that were classified from a member of the military, Bradley Manning. He really doesn't fall directly under this law, but it's broad enough, it is broad enough that certainly the government probably could use this law to incarcerate Julian Assange. Yeah, does that also include somebody like the, map, the Icelandic member of parliament, Birgitta Jansdottir, who's supposed to come here in, in April and is fearful of former safety? Uh, Tangerine Baldwin wishes to address that, but the answer to that is yes, it can apply to any such person. So, so, uh, you have to say my lawyer can correct me on this, but we have discussed it in a great line. Um, there are two hypotheses on the rationale and, and MO behind what the government is doing here. Um, there are two hypotheses uh, regarding what the rationale and the MO of the government, you know, what the rationale is doing. Sorry, what the rationale is here. Um, the first one is that there's been a pattern of disingenuousness on the part of the Department of Justice. Um, from day one in this case, as far as it, 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 it appears that there's been a deliberate conflation of the powers of indefinite detention under the authorization for use of military force from 2001, which allowed George Bush and company to go after terrorists, it had a very narrow uh, three classes of people that the AUMF uh, applies to. It's uh, people who participated or planned the 9-11 attacks, members of Al-Qaeda or the Taliban. That's it. Very, very narrow. Those are very firm parameters. Um, however, uh, the 2012 NDAA, the provision over which we're suing, added a paragraph, 1021B2. The government keeps claiming over and over again that the AUMF and NDAA are exactly the same, but 1021B2 does two things. It possibly retroactively legalizes the fact that they have been over broadly interpreting the AUMF for who knows how long, perhaps since 2001. It's a huge quagmire. Our case is potentially the latch on Pandora's box here. We threaten to expose the fact that possibly two administrations have been over broadly, possibly illegally interpreting a law, the AUMF. It's really dangerous for them. So 1021B2 appears to me, at least in my investigation, to be a deliberate attempt to legalize previous activities and to, they keep saying affirm and codify the AUMF. You don't need to codify a law, it's a law. The second theory on this, though, is that 1021B2 is very carefully crafted to go after people like Julian Assange and, and WikiLeaks. We don't know what's happening with the secret grand jury investigation. Obviously, none of us are privy to that information. It, but they haven't come forth with anything so far. The language of 1021B2 is so carefully written that perhaps it's written to apply to people like Julian without sending alarm bells ringing throughout mainstream media. It's a fine honed tool. And you can see that in the court arguments, the, the arguments over and over again. They're very careful with their words. If you're independent enough, you won't be in trouble. But they won't define independent. independent. Yeah, they won't define associated forces. So throughout our case, there's a deliberate conflation of these two laws. They would like you to believe that they've always had these powers of 1021B2. Patently false. So that's, I hope that answers your question about Julian Assange. Thank you. Uh, just the last point on that.
If we allow this door to open, this is a slippery slope. Whatever the government thinks, they may think, we're the good guys, we're only going after the bad guys, we'll never use these powers incorrectly. Well, I'm sorry, that's the us. And if they want to use these powers on Julian Assange and anyone else related to WikiLeaks, like Jacob Applebaum, who's here today, who will speak, uh, Birgitta Jan's daughter, etc., then that is a slippery slope that he can use to detain any of us. That's obviously what we're trying to stop. Yeah. So, uh, how many more questions can we take? Because there are people who need to speak. Let's, start, let's move on. Right, let, we, we have yeah. Dan. Yeah. Yeah. Dan Ellsberg is here. Dan Ellsberg. Yeah. Well, I spent the other night reading a 112 page decision by Catherine B. Ford. And at the end of it, I had a feeling that I don't have every day of the week these days. I felt proud of being an American. It came to me overwhelmingly as I read her arguments. Here's a judge appointed by President Obama who is shamefully being confronted now with arguments in favor of a blatantly unconstitutional provision. And for once, for once, a judge is willing to say this is facially unconstitutional no matter to whom, to when, under what circumstances. Uh, I doubt if the circuit court judges I'll be very pleasantly surprised that they have the courage to do what she's done and uh, not simply read time servers for their own uh, advancement. I doubt if this rule will advance her very much. Something that affects me very strongly <laughs> is this. Someone who is able to see so clearly that 1021b2 of the National Defense Authorization Act, which allows you to put an American citizen in civilian in military custody, treated like Bradley Manning is in the Marine Barracks right now, indefinitely without charges. That's not a fight he had to make in 1776. George III didn't have that power. No King of England didn't have a power like that since John I. So here we have a president, a democratic president, who is wiping out uh, the Magna Carta as well as the Constitution. What seems to be very clear is the three senators who were uh, advising, who were arguing this, for the indefinite detention without charges of American citizens <laughs> against the Fifth Amendment, is well described as an enemy of the Constitution of the United States. And I'm afraid that is true of the President at this point, and going along with this, having encouraged it earlier. And if every, pres every senator who votes for that. And let me remind you, every one of them, the civilians, took the same oath that Bradley Manning took and that I took as a Marine. And that is not for a commander in chief. It is not, it is not mentioned. It is not to obey the regulations of the commander in chief. It is solely to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies and foreign and domestic. It was clear to me for years that we were governed by a handful of people, Bush, Cheney in particular, Addington, Rumsfeld, who were, in a technical sense, and I do not mean rhetorically, enemies of the United States Constitution. That does not mean I thought they were traitors, that they appeared to anybody else, or that they didn't feel loyal to the United States and patriotic. I'm sure they wanted the best. And they're absolutely entitled to say that they believe that the current rights in the Bill of Rights are inappropriate, especially in a world of terror, and that we no longer deserve or can afford freedom of speech or freedom of rights. And that's their right as Americans. It is not their right to say it or act on it as members of the Congress of the United States or people who have taken that oath to support the Constitution as it is. The fact is that the people representing that case now, that the Judge Forrest's excellent decision, that firm decision of the people who understand the spirit of this country, it absolutely is right. It deserves to be confirmed. Those who vote against it, I would say, are voting, in some cases, you'll have to say, deluded, very deluded. But where they understand that what they're doing, they are violating their oath. So what it comes down to is, we can't trust the leaders of this country to protect our rights any more than we can trust Goldman Sachs or Wall Street in general when they sell us 
security. Well, think of the other institutions I could go through at this point. <clears throat> it really is up to us if Bradley Manning gets what he says, namely discussion, information, debate, and reform, then he says we are not doomed as a species. That sounds grandiose, that sounds self-serving there. It is not. In the world of climate control, in the world of nuclear weapons, but in the world of civil liberties, where this administration, this term, is turning in once again to the fourth term of George W. Bush on that area, it basically is up to us, no one else. And thank God we have an ally like Judge Elizabeth Forrest, but we need to support her, point out that she is not just expressing an opinion, she's saying blatant truth. And it's up to her to congratulate her, back it up, and see that the Supreme Court sees her life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've undergone a corporate coup d'etat. Your name, Chris? My name is Chris Hedges. Case <laughs> <laughs> Hedges versus Obama. Can you spell that? Uh, he is the captain. <laughs> hey. We've undergone a corporate coup d'etat. There is no impediment left now to corporate power. And the corporate state understands that as the economy continues to deteriorate, as the effects of climate change, and we just bore the brunt of that with Hurricane Sandy, over $70 billion worth of damage kicks in. There will be inevitable blowback on a betrayed population. And what's happening in this court now is the last thin line of defense between protecting what is left of our anemic democracy and the imposition of a military state. Yeah, The deterioration of civil liberties under the Obama administration has complete continuity with the attack on civil liberties under the Bush administration. In fact, under the Obama administration, it has been worse. The radical interpretation of the 2001 Authorization to Use Military Force Act as giving the U.S. government, in particular the executive branch, the right to assassinate American citizens. And we just saw the white paper leaked by NBC, leaked to NBC on the drone attacks. The use of the Espionage Act, as Dan mentioned, to shut down all whistleblowers, any narrative that challenged the official government narrative, the FISA Amendment Act, which retroactively makes legal what under our Constitution has traditionally been illegal, the warrantless wiretapping, monitoring, and eavesdropping of tens of millions of American citizens, and we know that our personal information is being stored in supercomputers in, U in Utah, and now the National Defense Authorization Act, Section 1021, overturning 200 years of domestic law to allow the military onto our streets to seize American citizens strip them of due process, put them in military facilities, including our offshore penal colonies, and hold them indefinitely. The corporate state knows what it's doing. If the Congress had put in one small sentence saying that U.S. citizens were exempt from this legislation, we would all pack up and go home. But they will not, because as Senator Graham pointed out, it is designed to detain U.S. citizens. And the bottom line is, as this unrest continues, the corporate state does not trust the police to protect them. It wants the ability to call in the military. This case is one of the most important cases in decades in the protection of our most basic and important constitutional rights. And the heroes of this case are standing next to me who have not earned a dime from this, Carl Mayer and Bruce Afron. They're the ones who do the work. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alexa O'Brien. Hi. How is everybody? Thank you for coming today. All right. I just prepared a short statement. When the U.S. government said in federal court that they wouldn't guarantee I wouldn't be indefinitely detained under Section 102.1b2, for articles I had written on the war on terror, what was at stake was more than our national politics of charismatic luckiness 
ambiguous scapegoats, and self-centered objectivity. Only fools argue that laws concerning the life and liberty of human beings should read in the poetry of fortune cookies and be backed up with the legal precedent of Yale speeches. Section 1021b2 was passed with bipartisan support, bought and paid for by lobbyists in one of the nation's most mistrusted congresses and signed into law by an ad age marketer of the year with a signing statement as arbitrary and deceptive as the Justice Department's about face appeal and argument in this very case. Let's dispense with the myth that the ubiquitous application of extrajudicial power is the exception to an unchecked executive. And let's dispense with the myth that Congress has the constitutional power to legislate the military detention of civilians. Yeah. Let's also dispense with the myth that the U.S. government hasn't already detained journalists under the AUMF seeking to gain intelligence <coughs> on media organizations. Or the myth that the President hasn't played a personal role in the imprisonment of a journalist covering the U.S. war on terror in Yemen. I've covered the WikiLeaks release of JTF memoranda known as the Guantanamo file and revolutions across the Middle East and North Africa. I've conducted hours of interviews with former Gitmo prison guards, detainees, defense lawyers, and human rights activists. For the last year, I've covered the U.S. investigation of WikiLeaks, and to date, I've published the only publicly available transcript of the secret prosecution of Bradley Manning taking place at Fort Meade. Because of my work as a journalist, government contractors attempted to falsely link a group which I helped found whose only purpose is to support campaign finance reform in the United States to Al-Qaeda. They even published articles of their own showcasing their ability to make Americans pay a hundred times more for the insecurity we could have had for free, stating the group that I helped found was infiltrated with Al-Qaeda and so-called cyber terrorists. Emails published by WikiLeaks indicated that other security contractors with ties to the U.S. government were specifically asked to connect this group to any Saudi or other fundamentalist Islamic organization. DHS published their unintelligent declaring an error to the group that I helped found was linked to cyber terrorists. I am grateful to the individuals, including a fellow journalist who privately warned me that there were other unpublished government documents and that agents had their sight on me. I am grateful to the attorneys, Paul Mayer and Bruce Afrin, to the other plaintiffs, to Tantrum Boland and to Chris Hedges, for their generosity of spirit towards me and their good work. Section 1021 violates the First and Fifth Amendments of the U.S. Constitution, our greatest protection against the rights to our liberty and national security. This legislative spawn of our national ideology, the war on terror, also preys on the spirit of people, because it offers us the illusion of an identity, of dignity, of morality, making it easier for this nation and our people to part with them all. Thank you. Thank you.